So, I bought another one. Some of you are shaking your head disapprovingly at me, fewer are excited to actually hear my thoughts about the game, but I'm gonna guarantee you that the vast majority of you people watching are probably completely fucking indifferent to the game and just want to know if this is worth your time or not. So in this video, versus all of my other uh, silent sit-downs, we're basically going to be comparing the solid mechanics of this and Fatal Bullet, rather than like my own feel so much, so it's gonna focus on the mechanics of the game and, again, being compared to Fatal Bullet. Since they're two completely different genres, I have to do mechanics and not really anything else, unfortunately, to actually make objective sense. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and introduce any newcomers to the actual point of the franchise, without any spoilers as well, so I'm not going to touch the story or anything, is what my point is here. I have everything written on power notes here on a notepad, so my apologies, I'm trying to get to what my mindset was when I wrote this originally. So, anyway, it's basically somewhat of a futuristic universe where virtual reality MMOs are a commonplace thing with something called full dive equipment or full dive gear. I forget what the fucking actual name of it is, though. But essentially, it paralyzes your body and it is a virtual reality headset that allows you to take the control, like all of your movements and stuff, you know, you, you flex your arm, you're flexing the actual character's arm in the VR MMO. You get to actually play and take the consciousness of that character, which sounds really pretty fucking neat if you ask me to any gamer, but also terrifying at the same time, because one, how would you even get that to work, and number two, how would you be able to get that to work in a controlled and safe fucking environment? It sounds terrifying when you really get down to it though, but dear god, that would be bad ass, and I feel like a lot of people would just further exacerbate the problem that already exists in a lot of eastern countries, especially Korea where they play video games for too long and they fucking starve themselves. Anyway, onward. This game particularly, Hollow Realization, takes place after Sword Art Online, which was a game that was set in the first arc of the original show. And the game basically centered around a number of players being trapped inside of this VR MMO, Sword Art Online, without a logout feature. And there was also another quirk to the game, of course, which leads to the iconic phrase, you die in the game, you die for real. I don't know if this game actually started that phrase or if it just reinvented it, but that's what I always associate it to. But anyway, Hollow Realization takes place after this game in something called Sword Art Origin, which is a complete remake of Sword Art Online with a plot that centers around an NPC that later adopts the name Premiere. And I can't really go into too much detail about Premiere and why she is the prime focus of the game or anything, but I'll say that as an NPC, she is particularly unique and just very different from all of the other things that people know about NPCs as a whole in the game. The game is very heavily centralized around its NPC populace, and I'll leave it there, because the rest of it is just better experienced on your own. This game is at a 75% off sale, by the way, right now. I'm not promoting anything or in any way, shape, or form where I'm, like, paid to do any of this shit, though. I'm just saying this is an excellent time where if any of these games in the franchise interest you, Sword Art Online in general, just all the games in the whole entire fucking... It's not a trilogy anymore. There's four games. But anyway, it's a good time to get them at 75% off. And it's... Honestly, well worth your time if you enjoy a bit of grind here and there. And it is a very heavily grind-centric game, I will fucking say that right now, though. Onward to the good, the bad, and the ugly of the game, however. So let's actually dive into the mechanics of it. Number one, one of the first things that I absolutely adored when I launched this game up for the first time, right? So, I launched up the map, I've gone through the game, I've I've checked out the uh, the town and all this other stuff, so I'm like, alright, cool, let's go down to the field and let's fight some monsters. And when the loading screen wraps up, much to my surprise, the game's performance is fucking gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous versus Fatal Bullet. I cannot stress that one enough. I could not stand how in Fatal Bullet, at least on the PS4, I don't know how this game runs on PC, but on PS4, the performance is just always goddamn Laggy. There is always a small latency with anything that you do in the game. Aiming, aim down sights, turning, 
button presses, jumping, uh, the LFG or whatever the fuck that it is that allows you to like hook up onto walls. Sometimes you hit buttons and it doesn't even register that you fucking hit them. I don't know if it's a frame rate issue or something with the engine, but it was very, very noticeable in Fatal Bullet. And in this game, I have hardly had any frame rate issues until there's like a lot of NPCs in an area in town and then it stammers a little bit, or sometimes it will spike when you're in certain areas. I know there's one spot in the forest that uh, heavily just dampered me. But anyway, it's just much better performance all around. Number two also that I want to touch is the overworld itself. There's just a lot more going on in this than there ever was in Fatal Bullet, which was just very empty with a couple of chests here and there, and really the primary thing that was drizzled around the map was if you were looking for some of the special enemies that were around the map, which didn't particularly do much interesting, if I'm going to be honest with you there. And they just were there to be sponges and just a little harder than usual, so they took more damage, and usually, in some circumstances, you needed to come back at a later time in uh, the game to be able to handle them because it was in another area of the map. But anyway, just the whole entire overworld is much more... Just much better, much more revamped in this one. There are these world events, for one, that remind me of Final Fantasy XIV-style fates, where you walk into, like, a little ring, and then it initiates something that you have to do, usually just slaying a bunch of enemies in that area, or a boss. And it's even better yet, too, these world events are also tied to something called an episode boss. I'm skipping a couple of bullets here, because they tie in perfectly. Where if you complete uh, certain world events then you also unlock an episode boss that spawns on a certain map within the world. And the world is divided into multiple segments, by the way, to each with a teleport edit. So the whole entire area is separated into multiple maps that need to be loaded individually. So usually you might need to move over to another area. I just slapped my mic arm. Or you are in the actual area a lot of times later on, and then the boss will just spawn right there. You kill it, and you get a really badass piece of equipment, which I fucking love that. There's a number of chests all around the map as well. I At first I thought that it needed more chests, but not necessarily. And I, another thing that I'll touch into a little bit later on as well is that these chests almost always contain the same stuff in them, which kind of killed my loot boner in the game. But, you know, whatever. Let's continue on further than that. There's also dungeons as well. Let me put that one in there before I continue further. There are these sacrament invasions that you need to do like a quest line to do to be able to unlock later versions of them in quote-unquote patching, like patch updates and stuff. And those are basically your dungeons. It's kind of like a tower defense style uh, slay the boss dungeon crawler thing. It's very interesting. I don't have any footage on it right now though, but the dungeons are pretty, pretty neat from what I've seen so far. But we're going to move over to the actual battle system in this game, which is surprisingly very in-depth, very fucking in-depth. It is obviously centralized around its sword skills. And you'll find later on down the line, very rarely will you be doing the base attack and not focusing on these sword skills. This is where 90% of your damage comes from by itself, naturally. You only use your basic attack to keep a combo multiplier going up on the enemy. As you continually attack it, and you don't let the bar... You'll see on these enemies there's a little mini bar on it underneath the multiplier. If that drops down to zero, it'll just put it to a regular one times damage multiplier on it. And the more that you attack it and use skills, it'll increase that multiplier until it caps out at either two times or 2.5 times. It can go even higher to, I believe, four times, so long as you initiate weak spot skills. So you can retaliate after an enemy attacks with these little red zone telegraphs, because again, very Final Fantasy XIV like. It's been done in a lot of other MMOs by this point, though, but there are telegraphs that they'll do, and if you would retaliate after the animation, there's a weak spot where you'll do extra damage and increase the multiplier even faster. Not only this, but you also have skill chaining that you can do off of your allies, which is really fucking awesome. So if you time your skills in tandem with your party members, you will also get a damage bonus from that. And you can also chain off of yourself. So every... I just learned this one literally last night. I forget what it's called, but it's just SSC is the abbreviation for it. Every time that I'll use a sword skill, you'll see here, there's a little blue flash that happens. And if you initiate another sword skill during that time, a different one, by the way, then you can chain skills together to a maximum that depends on what weapon that you're using or what skills that you have initiated, I believe. Maybe not necessarily the weapon. I haven't tested the weapon thing, so... I don't know if using a katana increases that, because that seems to be the skill chaining 
weapon to use. But anyway, moving further down the list, because I'm getting too caught up on individual parts and I'm going to run out of time here. So, affection and romance in this game is considerably... Tongue-tied, apparently. Cottonmouth as well. Much better than Fatal Bullet. Much fucking better in every conceivable way. Not even kidding. So, in Fatal Bullet, basically you just had to put somebody into your party and then use them long enough. I believe it was tied to the bounty that you accrue while that person is in the party, or it'll go up by a small burst every time that you revive them. So the only conceivable way to actually boost reputation or um, affinity for anybody was to just use them a lot, or bring them somewhere where they conti just continually fucking drop dead and keep reviving them, which was asinine and a pain in the ass. Considering that you needed to get your affinity high enough with every character in the goddamn game to get the good ending. In this game, there's a number of different ways that you can increase it, other than just using them in your group. You can, for number one, you can talk to people every time, and it'll boost it a very minor amount given, but it'll still bring it up. You can praise your allies as well, which is very important in building your character on how you want that AI to behave in combat as well. Every time that they do a certain skill or initiate a certain tactic, it'll usually be tied to some form of personality traits. Sundere, uh, cool, fiery, for example. And when you commend it, they will continually use it more. It'll increase the uh, proficiency of that personality trait. And some of these can actually inter uh, change their interactions with you when you do the little dating sim thing that you can, because like, there's these private chats as well that you can do with them, which is the best way to raise their affinity, which I was going to get into, so this is a perfect segue, where it is essentially a dating sim minigame. I, I have recording footage of it here, so hopefully it's running right now, but it is essentially a dating sim game, where you just, you, you stupidly nod to whatever the fuck that they say. Sometimes they'll throw you off and you have to shake your head and disagree with them, but usually it's just nodding like a dumb shit as you just creepily scoot in closer and do like these intimacy actions with them and depending on how high your intimacy is with that character they'll let you get away with more and eventually you can actually hold hands with that character for some goddamn reason yuki was just being an absolute fucking prude and would not hold my hand during this recording footage so i just swapped her out for straya <laughs> but um i've gotten it to work with her in the past but for some reason it just didn't want to work for this recording she knew she was being watched i guess and that holding hands gesture can also evolve into my favorite thing in the game, which is the princess carry, where you whisk your waifu away into the wind like she weighs nothing whatsoever, even though she's essentially just zeros and ones in an AI in a video game, so essentially she really does weigh nothing. In the case of Straya, she literally weighs nothing because she's actually an AI in the game and in actual real-life standards. But anyway, moving on further than that as well... You can also have a very interesting system in the game. You'll notice that in the town, there are a number of NPCs that wander around all over the goddamn place. And these characters in the game are supposed to be known to you as other players. I thought at first these were other people's players. I thought this was essentially the rift in Dragon's Dogma. It is not, and it disappointed me greatly when I figured this out. So... It is not other people's players in any way, shape, or form. These are just either procedurally or randomly generated characters in the game to represent other players. And you can actually befriend every single one of these characters. All you need to do is just accept this quest that has their name tied to it and then complete enough quests for them to gain enough affinity to make them friendly. Then uh, you they'll... Uh, ugh. I can't talk today. My apologies. This is what happens when you don't fully write out a script and, you know, take proper takes for it and just go in one cut. But they all will eventually send you a friend request after you hit level 3 affinity with them. And it's really neat because literally 90% of the fucking game I spent early on was just doing a bunch of fetch quests for other people. I swear to God, if I was actually able to hang out with Ricky, I would have wound up, like, ditching him for hanging out with other people in here. If you guys have ever seen that Persona 5 uh, moist meter with uh, Penguin Zero or Critical. It's basically like that. You <laughs> you feel like you're deserting your real-world friends for people in this game. It's just kind of immersive that way. And yeah, they are just normal fetch quests, but it's interesting that they uh, replicate the MMO feel in these games through this. And this is a lot more intuitive than anything Fatal Bullet ever did as well with all the other random characters. So I thought that that was just particularly neat. But moving on to the next page, there are, of course, cons. 
that I have with this, a number of them, even. One of the biggest ones is that you're just playing as Kirito in this game. Now, I know my character is obviously female that you're seeing here, and you can create a character all of your own, rename them and everything, but you're still taking the place of Kirito, and you will be voiced as Kirito and essentially just be a placeholder for him in the story. You can turn off the voice, thank God, but again, you're still a placeholder for Kirito in the storyline, so you don't actually have a place in this versus Fatal Bullet, which was an odd choice, honestly, and it kind of really made me care even less about the story as it was because of that, because I didn't feel like I was being an actual deus ex from, you know, Usually you try to roleplay as, like, a thing that you want to be, or you insert yourself into a story to be able to get into the roleplaying aspect of it, but that's kind of removed when you're actually playing as somebody who pre-exists in the storyline, if you catch my drift with that. As I had mentioned earlier, most of the overworld loot is also not random in this game. A lot of these chests... The dungeons, thank God, change it, and it is random, but a lot of the chests... I think literally all of them, actually, in the overworld will give you the same weapon every time that you go there, which completely relinquishes any any kind of motivation that you would have for killing any of the world bosses that give you drops, because you're going to get the same fucking thing every time. Every now and again, you might want to grind them to get a better star rating for things, but it's just not worth it for the minor stat increase. Later on in the game, I imagine that will change, because to my knowledge, there is a slight difference in the stats on most of the things that you pull. Sometimes it might be an agility base, other times it might be a strength base. And this is also important with the many sword skills in the game as well, because they all have scaling based off of certain stats on your character. So if you use a skill that you really like, that hits really fucking hard and scales highly with agility, you're going to want to stack agility on your character, which is, again, a very Final Fantasy eleven esque thing, or Final Fantasy MMO in general. So I'm very familiar with a lot of the shit that goes on in this game, because it's been done in these MMOs that I have played, which is very, very at home for me. But moving on to the actual cons, we're supposed to be shitting on stuff right now. So, the NPC system, while albeit sounds really awesome, if you're obsessive-compulsive, it's going to ruin you. You guys will notice that I have a number of quests that I don't turn in when I go into the board, and that's because... You can't just turn them in willy-nilly because they'll immediately be replenished as soon as your next available opportunity is to talk to the character or go to the quest board. And you'll just be inundated with a million quests for a million different fucking people. So you gotta, like, keep track of what characters that you want to bring up their affinity with by completing these quests, while also keeping the drops that you need for upgrading. I spent a large portion of this game not holding on to any of my drops and just giving them out to people, and then when I needed to upgrade shit, I didn't have my drops for it, and this is something that I'm still suffering from now, to upgrading my equipment and turning it into higher tier stuff. So, just letting you guys know ahead of time with that one, you might want to pay attention to who you're helping out with those quests if you decide to pick this game up. And then the final con that I have right here is that multiplayer does not allow for any story progression, at least to my knowledge. It is an instance-based thing where you jump into a lobby with other people and you get to actually pick one character from your game as your partner. Obviously, I'm going to pick Straya as my partner, or Silica, probably, depending on if I want a healer or a tank. And you just basically go from there, which... I don't necessarily have a problem with this system, but it is a con regardless. You can't work on your story progression with your buddies, is my point. You can't play with them in the game while they're sitting in town doing other things, which would have been a lot more intuitive and just a better way of going about it to be able to actually do the story progression. Do two different types of multiplayer, maybe, if you catch my drift on that. There's also one other thing that I didn't actually go over with as well, guys, is that the AI in this game are significantly better than they ever were in Fatal Bullet. If you guys are noticing from a lot of the combat, especially when I was opening this one up, my allies don't even need me half of the time. I know that we are like 15 levels higher than the things that we're fighting there, but even on things our level, my allies half of the time do not even need me there to be able to function. I'm just there for being able to do smarter human things. They will absolutely take care of themselves if you send them the proper commands, and the commands themselves in this game are a lot more intuitive. You can send all of your allies, for example, to evade at the same exact time, or send them after a target, or 
Have them target one character, and uh, one enemy, and then you go after another one separately. Which is amazing, especially with the bosses at the end of every zone that... They're effectively raids. You have four teams of four. And a lot of them revolve, or at least all of them, that I've fought so far revolve around taking out certain parts of the boss to be able to move on. But anyway, I'm going to just end the video here, guys. 20 minutes is plenty of time. My apologies for the whole droning thing. I just wanted to get a really good look at this game, so hopefully what you guys have seen, if you're looking up this video to see how the game is and whether or not it's right up your alley, I tried to touch on the actual hard mechanics of the game and what you should be expecting out of it. I didn't go into detail as much as I would have liked to, and I was all over the place with it, but I did... It's a pretty good summary of everything that you have to do in the game. I don't have recording footage for everything that I did, either. I was kind of on a time crunch on recording, so... My apologies. It's not technically a time crunch, but I was also getting messages from people. So, I wanted to not get that message to pop up on screen again, essentially. So, I will see you guys later. Hopefully I'll make videos of this, and I know that I'm also going to be doing another video very soon regarding Fatal Bullet because there's a fourth fucking DLC that I don't have, so I need to get it, and I'll probably be rebuying it on PC like the terrible fucking scrub throwing money at Bandai Namco for terrible Sword Art Online games. They're really not that terrible, but they obviously could be considerably better, and they're, they're just there to appeal to the audience that likes Sword Art Online, essentially. It is very obvious. So, again, later, guys. I will see you later.